And so now we're going to look a little forward and, you know, the autonomous uh, connected electric. Uh, I saw some uh, a YouTube video that you put on uh, your site talking about some of your, uh, uh, literally your vision <laughs> of the buses. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. So, so we're currently using autonomous vehicle technology in a number of cities for what we would call functional assist. And the most frequent utilization of autonomous technology in the Proterra system is simply helping the bus align and stop at exactly the right position for automated charging. So that's really where we got started with AV. And I think for a lot of commercial and industrial companies, that's where you start. You find a job that needs to be done over and over and over and over, and it needs to be done perfectly. Um, the driver maintains control of the vehicle the entire time, but autonomous technology helps them um, hit the uh, hit the bullseye every single time. So basically, you have a robotic charging arm of some sort to uh, charge the thing. And the yeah, the arm can find the top of the bus, and the bus knows exactly where to stop, and it won't pass the point. It's almost like there's an invisible tennis ball hanging in the garage, so you can park okay. the bus exactly where you need it to be. It sounds trivial, but when you need to fast charge a bus ten or a hundred thousand times in a single year, you need to be you need to do it perfectly so that you've got system reliability. Now that that initial foray into functional assist led us into our initial work on enhanced safety, and that's the next phase of autonomy for mass transit. So the first customer that we're working with on this, it's a partnership with the University of Nevada Reno campus, um, a couple other technology providers as well. Reno already had our electric buses deployed, and working with the transit agency, RTC, and the University of Nevada, Reno, we took one of the electric buses and started deploying advanced sensor technology. And we're looking at a couple scenarios right now, and we're testing to see how good the AV really is in a mass transit application. One of the videos I'm guessing you saw was a demonstration of visual object detection. So we're driving a real-world transit bus, picking up passengers, dealing with cross-traffic, and the software at 20 frames per second is identifying anything that can be a moving object, a human being, someone on a bicycle, and a car. Um, and what we're looking for is gaps in the software because I do feel that we are, there's a lot of hype around autonomous. Autonomous has incredible potential. But for an application like trucking or mass transit or taxis, you cannot get to 99.9% .9 and then roll it out. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure, and it, you know, our philosophy, we will be running these tests for probably a year, looking at this system in every weather condition, all times of day, um, road conditions. We're going to be looking at situations where the streets are absolutely jammed with pedestrians, mm -hmm. where people are jaywalking. Because we've got to make sure that this is right when we go live. Now is, it, now, is it fusing multiple sensors, or is it just cameras at this point? Are you doing LIDAR, radar, et cetera? It is fusing multiple sensors. So some of the simulations we're doing are fusing GPS information, um, cutting off the GPS at certain times to simulate the urban canyon. It's vision. It's LIDAR. I believe we have radar and ultrasonic as well, uh, but I, I know we're using... Um, we're refusing LIDAR and, um, and vision at a minimum. Now, at this point, it's just gathering the data. You're not actually doing anything with the data and controlling breaks and things like that yet? We are simulating what the, um, what the data would suggest, but it okay. doesn't actually get to control the vehicle. So there's a firewall between the controls of the vehicle and what the sensor package is doing. Uh, this gives us a really nice way to backtest how safe the software is. Um, and we're, you know, transit buses drive four to five times more miles per year and in all conditions. So it gives us a very accelerated and chaotic uh, environment to test the system. I would imagine too, especially if you start to put it into machine learning algorithms, you have a better data set in the sense that you've got pretty good drivers generally uh, who are driving these buses, right? We do. One of the other interesting opportunities with mass transit is we have very consistent a, B, C, D testing in terms of what exactly was happening on that route. Because a bus route, Route 294, Route 17, the bus tends to be driving roughly the same velocity on exactly the same track, sometimes even in the same lane, over and over and over. So we're, all, we're able to do sort of fine grain adjustments sure. in a real world operating environment. And you know, one of the things it reveals is that even for known mapped routes where you've already gone through and scanned the entire route, 
you still can experience a lot of variability, a parking cone, a, you know, a police car that's pulled over another vehicle. So it, I think it really is demonstrating the true complexity, especially if we're going to operate in the urban environment. Personally, I think this will get figured out, but I'm not entirely certain that this means that we're looking at driverless mass transit vehicles. I think we may be looking at some interesting options where you can have chase and follower vehicles, mm. which would eliminate the need for things like um, the articulated buses, mm -hmm. which tend to work really well at rush hour, but then are very expensive the rest of the day because it's a very big, heavy yeah. bus. And um, most part, or during most times of the day, it doesn't have many people on it. So you may be able to deal with your peak capacity problems um, in a more efficient way. So uh, kind of a virtual bus, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you'll you'll probably, if I had to guess, I think you'll have um, a mix of buses that have human drivers and assistants, and then buses that are there for surplus capacity, or a bus that can be very quickly dispatched from a uh, distributed depot when a bus driver starts signaling that their ridership counts are going up. Mm -hmm. Because mass transit and, and urban traffic is a much more complex problem than most um, entrepreneurs and innovators have thought through. It's almost like figuring out how the grid works. You don't size a transportation system um, for an average amount of ridership. You have to size for peak. peak right. um, and that has some interesting implications on what type of vehicles do you run, how do you staff. I think autonomous can help manage the cost of the peak. It seems like you can start to right size the vehicles and, and maybe make them smaller modules, but then like you say with this virtual, you can create a virtual large vehicle, right? Yeah, you can. You could, I mean, I, I could see, you're already seeing some of the stuff in trucking where the concept of platooning is starting mm -hmm. to make sense. And, you know, everyone wants to run the most efficient um, the most universal form factor of vehicle. It's like every, you know, the story with Southwest Airlines or the strategy on Southwest Airlines. The majority of their stock is the 737. So then their spare parts are very similar. Right. Training is very similar. Um, I, you know, there's definitely a desire to do that in mass transit. It's one of the reasons why 40-foot buses make up about 65% of the market. And then you have a much smaller segment of the market being sub 40 foot or greater than 40 foot has a lot to do with commonality. The other thing is agencies don't want route specific vehicles. If you're San Francisco or you're San Jose or New York City in the morning, a bus could roll out of the yard and it could be in a vehicle collision or something else could happen or you have a driver uh, call in sick. You may need to reroute a different vehicle and it's much easier to be flexible if every vehicle can do every route. I do think, though, what, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I could see maybe the 40-foot bus gets a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I doubt it gets – I don't think we'll get to a world of, of kind of micro pod buses because I think you end up having an incredible amount of friction at that point of everyone wanting to go exactly where they want and stopping and starting exactly when they want to. I also think it's, you know, it's a classic optimization problem. If you have a larger vehicle – you can move 70 people with one electric motor and one energy mm -hmm. storage system. Um, so it's, a, it's an optimization problem. Smaller vehicles are more flexible, but they're also higher capex per person per mile. Do you see scenarios though where there might be uh, feeder routes that are maybe the larger buses and then maybe uh, low speed autonomous shuttles in the neighborhood type thing to get to the feeder buses? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think in the history of transportation, we've seen that many times. So we had trains before we had wheeled transit buses. Um, when buses came along, they replaced a lot of rail systems and they lowered the cost of rail, but they didn't entirely replace rail. And any time where you have a very, very high capacity, uh, high ridership known route, like if you think about Caltrain or BART in the San Francisco Bay Area, basically linking San Jose and uh, San Francisco as directly as possible. It's very difficult for buses to compete with rail when you have thousands of people who show up, and you see this in the developing world as well, and everyone needs to get to work on time and everyone tends to leave work roughly around the same time. So um, buses tend to serve as the connective tissue in the system. Mm -hmm. Now I think what's gonna happen is we're still gonna have rail, 
rail, when it's fully utilized, is going to be one of the fastest, most direct ways to get from point A to point B. We're still going to have buses, and they're going to fill in kind of in the, the medium zone. And then I think a lot of the capillary services, which are difficult for buses to provide efficiently, I think that could very likely go to not just autonomous, but also services like Uber and Lyft. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, they're looking very heavily at autonomous, right? Uh, both those services. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think partly it's because their, their model doesn't uh, work very cost effectively sure. with the driver right now. Um, so I think in some ways it's more of an existential question for some of the ride hailing companies. If they can eliminate the cost of a driver, then their models will be much more profitable. What's interesting for mass transit is once you've lowered costs per mile by 80% with EV, mm -hmm. you have a very competitive, profitable way of moving people per mile. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how EV and AV are deployed across all these sectors. Um, but I definitely believe in multimodal networks as being the lowest cost, most efficient, and also most green way of moving from point A to point B, especially in a city. So. I, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. The, the one system that I think is going to see secular decline is the personal uh, passenger automobile, especially one running on an internal combustion engine and getting 20 miles the gallon. They're difficult to park. Uh, they're stressful to drive in traffic. And increasingly, mayors are saying, I want to get as many cars out of my downtown area as possible. So I think we are, cars will always be with us. But I, I don't think owning and driving a car is going to be nearly as common 20 years from now. Is that going to just be driven by the economics, the pure economics of it? It is, but I think the economics apply across a number of fronts. One of the things that, that's changing that doesn't get a, a lot of attention is that the value, especially of an engineer or a designer or a knowledge worker being online is very, very high per hour. So the opportunity cost per hour of having a software engineer at Google or Facebook driving a car for two hours a day, um, it makes very little sense. In fact, if we're looking for productivity gains in the US economy, there's a major source of untapped productivity, which wouldn't even extend the workday, which would be take all of the commuters and let them actually get some work done, whether it's personal or professional. We're already seeing a microcosm of this economic phenomenon with the tech buses. Sure. So the top 12 employers in the Bay Area in the tech economy um, operate or lease a fleet of 1,000 heavy-duty diesel buses right now. A lot of the reason they're doing that is it's just it makes good business sense to have a programmer be a programmer versus having them be an Uber driver for their first hour and their last hour right. going back and forth an to work. An Uber driver for one, which kind of leads to the whole idea. Of, it seems like electrification changes things as far as the design. It gives you a lot more design freedom. So kind of what sort of things do you see in terms of mobile living spaces, whether it's mobile offices like that? How can th these mobile things that we have evolve to kind of meet these new demands? Well, one of the, one of the most fascinating things we're, we're starting to think through is how do, you, how do you define an electric bus or an electric truck? Is it an electric vehicle that has energy storage or is it energy storage that has mobility? Mm. Because depending on the situation, if a utility looks at an electric truck or an electric bus, and it's got four or 500 kilowatt hours, they buy and deploy products like that and park them in parking lots for utility scale storage. So there are, you know, fascinating things are gonna change as we, we, we see this kind of emergence or this convergence of grid energy, mobile energy, transportation, um, as well as connectivity. You know, if you're bringing a battery with you, does that mean you provide energy when you get to mm -hmm. your endpoint, or do you buy energy? And do you worry about any of that, or is that a software or a networking service that you're associated with? Because depending on where you drive that battery in the system, you may either be a buyer of energy, or you may actually have brought something into a market that's desperately needed. We see this with... Um, with solar, for example, in a lot of our um, sunnier markets, the solar peak occurs and cause and ends up being the highest source of uh, or the largest source of electricity on the grid. So Southern California between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. on a sunny day is producing 
massive amount of solar electricity and they're looking for applications. That's a moment where electric vehicles could be charging effectively for free. When those vehicles get home, solar is coming offline. So you may be charging your battery at work and just like you know, sometimes you pick up to-go food on the way home, you may be taking solar energy with you home and plugging it in when you get to your garage and running your house on it for that shoulder in the evening where you're not yet asleep and you're still using energy. So it's, it's a lot of fun. A lot of things are changing. No one, I don't think anybody has a clear crystal ball on it, but it is the fact that the oil market and the electricity market are coming together, that's really never happened before. And it's creating a lot of opportunities. Well, it seems like uh, you guys are just, I mean, you've been at this for a long time, but it seems like there's still a lot of runway in front of you and a lot of exciting times. So I really appreciate you sharing what you've done so far and look forward to continuing to follow you as the years go by. Well, thanks a lot. Definitely appreciate the time and enjoy the conversation.